Uh, first off, I have a couple slides in this talk that have a bit of small font for like code samples and stuff. So if you go to this URL, uh, thanks to the great website that this event has, you can just like look at the slides on your own laptop. Um, all right. Um, I'm Jan Horn from Google Project Zero. I'm here today to um, talk about um, some tricks that uh, can be used to exploit uh, race conditions in Linux environment. Um, all of the bugs that I'm talking about here have been fixed for a long time. Like one of the bugs is from like 2016. Uh, to other stuff from last year, um, and all of the exploits are against kernel 4.4, which um, in Android land still is relevant for some devices, but of course on like desktop Linux land is very ancient. Uh, but the focus here is on like exploitation techniques, uh, not on the individual bugs. So I think that's fine. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking. About, I'm going to be using three different bugs as examples today uh, to talk about exploitation techniques. The first bug is uh, something that gives you a use of the free of a physical page uh, through a stale TLB entry. Uh, and that re exploiting that requ uh, is, requires hitting a narrow taming window. And I'll talk a bit about uh, how the behavior of the body allocator uh, influences how you can exploit this and how uh, you can play with a preemption and with the scheduler uh, to make your race window bigger. Uh, then there's a second bug uh, that was a a kernel bug that let you decrement the reference count in a struct file. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about how uh, you can exploit that in a way that would normally be a race condition, but then use user fault FD and fuse to make it deterministic again. Uh, and how the KCMP sys call helps with exploiting use after free bugs. And then there's a third bug, which was uh, an Android user space bug, where exploitation um, required a primitive that was somewhat similar to what you'd get with um, Fuse or user fault FD, but those aren't available on Android. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about how uh, you can uh, sort of build a poor man's uh, alternative to that. OK, so the first bug I'm talking about is a race between the Emory map and F allocates as calls. Uh, as a quick bit of background, uh, uh, but you need to understand how the bug works. Um, on uh, you, uh, in the CPU, you have the transla translation lookaside buffer, which um, caches um, page table entries basically, uh, so that you can do address translations faster than always walking the page tables. Uh, and while the page table entries uh, are essentially like ref counted pointers to pages, uh, the TLB just borrows references uh, from your page tables because the CPU isn't going to like be incrementing and decrementing references uh, on your page structures. Uh, so this means that when you're removing entries from your page tables, you need to also clear out the corresponding cache entries in the TLB, otherwise you get a use of the freeze. Um, the, the first syscall that participates in this bug and the one that uh, actually um, had the buggy code is the Emory map uh, syscall. Emory map can be used to move a memory mapping from one virtual address to another virtual address. This, of course, requires uh, creating a new uh, a virtual uh, memory area structure and so on, but it also requires moving the actual page table entries and allocating new page tables for the destination address range. Uh, so Emory map has to uh, go and uh, allocate new page tables for the new mapping then move the page table entries over from the old mapping into the new mapping, and then clear the translation lookaside buffer for the old address range. Uh, the second bug that participates, the second uh, syscall that participates in the race is f allocate. f allocate allows you to allocate or deallocate space for a file. Um, and if you use um, f allocate to deallocate space from a file, it not only deallocates pages on disk, but it also tries to free up uh, page cache files uh, sorry, page cache pages uh, um, that are currently cached in the kernel. So when you um, use um, f allocate, it has to go and iterate through all of the virtual memory areas across different processes on the system that include this file range, and then uh, y tries to yank out the pages from them. So it um, looks for uh, page table entries that are non-zero, um, deletes the page table entries, flushes the, uh, the TLB range, and then drops the references on the pages. Uh, and the race here was uh, that Emory map didn't hold any locks between um, the time it moved the page table entries from the old address to the new address, and when it did the TLB flush at the old address. Uh, so this mean, means that you could have a race where first Emory map moves the page table entries from, from the old address to the new address, but you can still have um, stale TLB entries for the old virtual address. Then F allocate comes along, uh, deletes the page table entries at the new address, 
there's a TLB flash that removes entries for the new address range, but not the old address range. And then F allocate would drop references on the pages. And at this point, you'd have stale TLB entries pointing to pages that have already potentially been put back on the page free list. Um, so this gives you a use of the free of a physical page. Um, and on Linux before 4.9, this was actually exploitable to get write access to pages. Um, starting with 4.9, getting write access was a very narrow timing window, and only read access to pages was easier. Um, so I decided to write an exploit for the Pixel 2 phone because that still runs a 4.4 kernel. Um, so the first exploit idea that I had here was okay, um, we have a f physical page in the free list and uh, we have we had like full read and write access to this page. Let's try to reallocate this page so that it contains kernel data. Uh, the thing is that the kernel page allocator, the body allocator, um, has the vaguely this behavior I have up here. This isn't entirely accurate, and if someone here knows the allocator, please don't uh, think too badly of me for simplifying it this way. But basically, the idea is that we have this free page that gets put onto this uh, red per CPU, per CPU free list up there, um, which is a free list that is specific to the migration type um, migrate movable for pages that uh, can arbitrarily be moved around by the kernel. Um, and kernel allocations for like kernel internal data structures normally come from the migrate unmovable lists. And the page allocator kind of tries to keep those memory types separate, and if you want a page to move from like movable type to an unmovable type, you need to create memory pressure and stuff, uh, and it gets messy, and I didn't want to deal with that. Uh, so instead, I decided to um, go for reallocating the page as, again, a page belonging to user space. So you could either reallocate the page as an anonymous page in some other process, but that would require you to interact with another user space process, and that user space process might do other things that disturb the kernel heap and so on. So that didn't seem like such a good idea. So I decided to go for reallocating the page uh, as a page cache file. So what this means is um, you uh, trigger this um, bug to get the page freed, then you trigger a read on a specific page in some shared library that is used by a privileged process. And then this read will allocate the page that you just freed uh, and put it in the page cache for the file, um, read data from disk into this page, uh, and then uh, hopefully you can modify um, this page of code um, before, the, the, before some privileged process continues to use this code. And then you can escalate privileges into the context of that uh, process. Um, there are two things that make this kind of hard. The first thing is that you need to detect when n remap is at the right point where you want to interrupt it and do your uh, f allocate operation. Uh, luckily, as an attacker, we can use procfs for this because procfs contains statistics about the memory usage of each process, including specifically how much memory is used for page tables. Uh, so we can see exactly when m remap is allocating memory for new page tables and then use that as a signal. Um, the other thing is that the way I chose to exploit this requires that uh, we have this TLB entry uh, long enough. Um, uh, it requires that the emory map operation uh, takes so long that uh, in the middle of the emory map operation, we can not just reallocate the page but also do disk I/O because. Um, we want to be doing our use of the free write after data has been fetched from the disk into the page. Otherwise, the disk is just going to overwrite the data we put in there. So uh, uh, the plan for exploiting this requires knowing a bit about how preemption works. So Linux has, um, on Linux, user space programs can al uh, always basically be preempted by sending interprocessor interrupts or something like that. So, but it gets more complicated when you're running in kernel context. Uh, Linux there supports the three different preemption models. One of them is the voluntary preemption model, where kernel code explicitly calls um, cont resget to say, hey, I can be preempted at this point. Uh, and this is used by many Linux distros by default, but Android uses full preemption model uh, in which um, you can send like interprocessor interrupts to uh, interrupt a to preempt a kernel code that is executing in almost any context as long as, long as it's not 
holding a spin log or something like that. And importantly, mutexes do not behave like spin logs. Mutexes do not um, prevent preemption. Mm. And Linux also gives us a lot of control over the scheduler's behavior. So basically, the idea is that you can tell the scheduler to make your task run faster, or give it higher priority, but you can tell the scheduler that your own tasks should run at um, a reduced priority or should only be running on certain CPU cores or things like that. Um, and if you, for example, say this task should have idle priority, it should run uh, at, at very low priority, and there's some other task r that's running on the same CPU at normal priority, then you only get woken up something like uh, once a second. Uh, also, a task with idle priority uh, never preempts other tasks. So this means that if you have an idle task that is um, waiting for some input to arrive, and then that input arrives, but some other task is currently running on the same CPU, then you will not be switching over to the idle task until like the next scheduler tick arrives, or something like that. And importantly, these, uh, these scheduler controls do not just affect your um, tasks when they're executing user space mode, uh, but they also affect the execution of kernel code um, in, in syscall context on behalf of your tasks. So this means that you can, for example, take uh, uh, create two tasks yourself, put them on the same CPU core by telling the scheduler these tasks may only run on the CPU core, um, set one of them to idle scheduling priority and the other one to normal priority, and then let the uh, idle priority task uh, start executing some syscall that, for example, uh, takes a lock at some point. Uh, takes Sorry. Reset. <laughs> um, yeah, you can, uh, you can have your idle task um, execute some syscall, and then in the middle of that syscall, um, wake up your normal priority task, and then you can use this to stall the execution of this, uh, of this syscall, uh, potentially in the middle of some race condition or something like that, um, for uh, quite some time. Uh, so here's a uh, timing diagram of um, how uh, I uh, ended up exploiting this bug. Uh, I'll go through this uh, step by step. So um, we have five tasks here uh, across four CPU cores. Each task is pinned to a specific CPU core. Um, at the start, we have tasks B and C sharing one CPU core. Each other task has its own uh, CPU core. And only task B is running at idle priority. Uh, every, everything else has normal priority. Uh, task E is the task that uh, uh, is a task that is just in a busy loop uh, trying to read and write the uh, page, the virtual address um, in the old mapping where we are about to get a stale TLB entry. The idea here is that by in a busy loop uh, constantly accessing the address, as long as the page table entry still exists, uh, when the TLB entry goes away, we're immediately refreshing the TLB entry. Um, and then later, when the page table entry has gone away and we still have our stale TLB entry, uh, we can detect when uh, the page contains the code we expect so that we actually know that the page was reallocated in the place we wanted. Um, uh, and then we override it. Um, uh, task, uh, task C um, starts off by uh, readings from some empty pipe, which causes it to block. Um, which means that at that point, uh, task B can, um, can execute since it's the only thing that's runnable on the CPU. Uh, task B starts executing memory map and starts allocating memory for page tables and moving page table entries. Uh, at this point, task D, which is in a busy loop um, pulling the st uh, statistics in procfs, um, can, can notice uh, the progress of the memory map operation uh, and wake up task C by writing to the pipe that task C is blocking on. At this point, task C preempts task B be because task B is idle priority and task C is not. Um, so now uh, task B is in the middle of this memory map operation where we want it. And um, the first thing task C now does is to uh, move task B over to CPU 0 where task A is running. And task A is just um, spinning in a loop. So task B is probably not going to get woken up for quite some time. And uh, at this point, uh, task C can use f allocate. Uh, to, trick, to uh, perform the other side of the race, 
uh, putting the page on the per CPU free list, and then uh, use the pre-read syscall uh, to read a page uh, from the library we're targeting, uh, and reallocate the page as page cache, and uh, at that point, hopefully, task E will then uh, see the page cache uh, contents and overwrite them with arbitrary code. Uh, okay, uh, that was the first bug. Uh, as a second example, um, uh, this one's a bit easier. Uh, there, this was a bug from uh, 2016, a bug that let you arbitrarily decrement the ref count on a struct file. Um, the bug itself doesn't actually have a uh, race con uh, condition in it, but the way I chose to exploit it would normally um, be a race. Uh, without special tricks. Uh, as a bit of background for this, uh, on Linux you have two mechanisms, uh, user fault FD and fuse, that allow user space to synchronously handle page faults. Um, in the case of user fault FD, that's precisely the intent. Uh, user fault FD is specifically a mechanism uh, with the intent to allow user space to synchronously um, handle uh, page faults, whereas with fuse, you can basically construct the same primitive by mounting a fuse file system and then M mapping a file from it. And when you have a page fault uh, in a, f a file that is backed by a fuse file system, uh, the fuse file system um, gets to resolve the page fault at any time it wants. Um, and you can use this these two tricks on like normal des uh, desktop Linux systems to arbitrarily block kernel code execution at any point where the kernel does things like a copy from user, copy to user, get user, put user, and so on. Um, but on Android, uh, user fault FD and fuse uh, are not exposed uh, to unprivileged code, um, so uh, it's not really usable there. Uh, so uh, here's the bug I want to use as, a, as, a, as an example here. Um, basically, uh, you can see the code on the right-hand side. We have uh, this FD get, which takes a reference to a struct file, uh, and then we call it this the BPF map get function which uh, has an error case where it calls FD put, then returns an error code, and then we go into this uh, if L branch uh, in the upper uh, part of the code, uh, and this branch again calls FD put, so it's uh, like a straightforward bug that just over decrements the reference count. Hmm? Okay. Um, A syscall that's very useful for exploiting um, user to freeze on certain um, data structures, including struct file, is the KCMP syscall, which is available on kernels that uh, activate a checkpoint restore. Um, KCMP, you can basically see what it does on the right hand side, uh, is a syscall for making um, uh, arithmetic comparisons between obfuscated kernel pointers. Uh, so, the intent here is that if you have, for example, a process with a big file descriptor table uh, and you want to figure out um, which ones of those file descriptors map to the same struct file, um, so in other words, which file descriptors share the same file description object, uh, instead of doing like pairwise comparisons between the file descriptors somehow, you can uh, do like a normal n log n sorting algorithm where as the comparison function, you use the KCM pieces call. Um, so this works on a bunch of uh, different uh, data structures in the kernel that are quite important, including like uh, struct file, mm struct, file struct, and so on. Um, but this is also useful for exploiting use of freeze because, for example, if in your file descriptor table you have one uh, pointer to a file, yeah, you have a dangling pointer to a file that has actually been freed, and then you reallocate that memory for another struct file and get a pointer to that in your file descriptor table, then you can ask KCMP, hey, um, did I reallocate the new struct file in exactly the same place as the old struct file, or did I hit some other memory location? Uh, so this can be used to make exploits very reliable. And I think this also might have some interesting implications in the future, unless it's handled especially for memory tagging, because um, you can ignore this if you don't know what memory tagging is, but basically with memory tagging you have these tag widths as part uh, of your pointers, uh, and these tag widths are secret, and if you can leak them, you can defeat the mitigation. Um, and this thing compares the complete pointers, including the tag widths. So you could use this to um, repeatedly query whether the tag widths are the same, and then if they're not the same, you can retry until they match up. 
uh, yeah, so uh, here's what um, back in the 4.4 days the VFS write function looked like. So at the very start of the VS, um, uh, VFS write VE function, uh, we have a check that um, checks if uh, we have read access, uh, if, if we have write access on this file descriptor, uh, and if we do not, it bails out. Um, so the way you can exploit uh, the bug is you um, create a, uh, you create a fuse file system, you mmap a file from this fuse uh, file system, um, you open a slash dev slash null as writable, and then you start a write view operation on dev null, which has its IO vector stored uh, inside the fuse mapping. So the write view syscall comes in, does the check, sees, okay, the file is writable, uh, we can continue, and then uh, uh, further down you can see this import IO vector call, where we import the IO vector from user space. So at this point, um, import IO vector has to do a copy from user uh, on this memory region that is backed by a fuse file system. This blocks until user space resolves the page fault by supplying uh, some data. Uh, so at this point, uh, we have as much time as we want to trigger our use of the free, um, uh, free this um, dev null file struct that we're operating on, and reallocate it as something else. Um, now, normally when people export use of the free, they do stuff like, oh, we replace this struct with a struct of a completely different type, so we turn our use of the free into a type confusion where we are interpreting numbers as pointers or interpreting a type, point of one type as another type or something like that. But what you can also do is you can just allocate another struct file. So we open slash dev slash cron tab as read only, and then we can use the KCMP trick to check whether we indeed place the cron tab file at the same location where we previously had our dev null file. Um, and then if we see that it worked, we can resolve the page fault and do read view, write view continues. Um, and it performs the actual write, write operation uh, on the etc cron tab file. So now we can write arbitrary content in the, uh, in the cron tab uh, and uh, elevate privileges to root. And this whole thing works without any like uh, uh, type confusions or like ROP or any of these things. Uh, Okay, and the third bug example that I have is uh, use of the getPitcon function in Android. So uh, as background, uh, when you have some system where you're, where you're integrating with SLinux, uh, user space demons sometimes need to figure out uh, what is the SLinux context of the peer that I'm talking to. Like if you have some daemon and it's re receiving requests from some client and has to check, is the client allowed to do this? Um, so for Unix domain sockets, uh, um, the situation there's pretty nice. You can use things like uh, SO peer sec um, to ask the kernel, hey, what's the security context of my peer? But until recently, Android's binder IPC system uh, didn't tell you that. Binder just gave you um, the UID and the process ID of the sender. Um, so luckily, there's a helper function that you can use uh, in this case, which is called getPitcon. You give it a PID. Uh, and it gives you the SLinux context of the process uh, with that PID. So obviously this has problems because, um, uh, for example, there's the, uh, the classic uh, PID reuse problem that if the sender of the message goes away and then another process spawns uh, and reuses that PID uh, before you get around to doing this check, uh, then you see some completely different SLinux context that has nothing to do with the actual sender of the message. Um, and the way that getPitcon is implemented is basically that it opens uh, in procfs uh, under the process directory, the adder slash current file, uh, and reads from that. Uh, yeah, so in Android, there's this hardware service manager thing. You don't really know what, need to do, know what it is, but it's basically like some uh, a daemon that manages names. Uh, and uh, this is reachable from um, like a normal application context and from other places in the system. And this uh, thing receives, uh, receives some uh, IPC calls and then it has to figure out what the context of the sender is. Um, and it used getPitcon for this. Um, so to exploit this, we have to um, exit our sending process and then we need to make some privileged uh, thread spawn somewhere in the system um, that reuses the PID. Uh, and like for making a privileged uh, thread spawn somewhere in the system that uh, requires user space interaction and isn't very fast. And so it would be nice if we could stretch this race window out 
um, between the time the binder IPC is received and the time uh, get pitcon actually reads the SLinux context. And luckily, we can make, uh, on like 4.4 kernels, we can make um, this get pitcon call that just um, opens the file in, in procfs and reads from it, take something like 15, 20 seconds. Uh, so as background for this, on uh, lin uh, up until like kernel 4.7, um, there's a mutex uh, uh, in the inode struct which um, protects uh, uh, a bunch of operations, uh, including a get dense, which is used for like the read, read the ellipse function. So this function uh, takes uh, this mutex on an inode, then iterates over the uh, directory entries for this inode, uh, copies the directory entries to user space while holding the lock, um, and then drops the lock in the end. So if you have a big directory, uh, and um, you're doing this operation, you're holding this mutex um, while accessing a lot of user space memory, which can take uh, a lot of time. Um, another path that also takes the inode mutex is the lookup slow function, uh, which is used um, if you don't have like a cached directory entry um, for the name that you're trying to look up. Uh, so for example, in procfs, uh, if you haven't accessed a process through procfs before, there won't be a, a cached directory entry for it. Uh, so this means that if we can make, uh, if we can uh, call uh, get dense and make that take a long time, then we can also block this, the open call that um, get pitcon does for the same amount of time. Uh, most of you probably already know this stuff, um, but uh, in operating systems you can have the problem of priority inversion where you have um, three tasks, uh, task A with um, high priority, task B with normal priority, task C with low priority, and then if, uh, Task C, which has the lowest priority, takes some lock and then gets preempted by task B, um, uh, which is um, uh, running for an extended amount of time. And then at a later point, task A wakes up and tries to take the lock. Task A uh, blocks on the lock. Uh, task A can't acquire the lock because task C is holding the lock, and task C can't make progress because task B is blocking the CPU. So effectively, task B is running even though it has lower priority than task A. Um, and this doesn't just apply if you have a task A and task B with different priorities. It also applies if you have tasks A and B with not the same priority because then um, you're still violating fairness between the two processes that should be scheduled like 50-50, but actually one of them gets um, all of the CPU time. Um, and this also works with kernel mutexes because uh, they don't protect against priority inversion unless you're on like an, a preempt RT system. Um, so this means that um, we can uh, potentially block um, execution by creating, by artificially creating priority inversion problems. Okay, so um, here's the basic idea. Uh, instead of using user fault FD um, to block a user space access for as long as we want, we um, create two tasks, uh, task A and task B, and pin them to the same CPU. Uh, task A gets idle priority, task B gets normal priority, and task B is executing a spin loop. So now we let uh, task A execute a read the operation. This read the operation uh, takes the mutex, um, and then it um, starts doing a user, um, a user space memory access. The user space memory access triggers a page fault, which triggers I.O. Now the I.O. operation itself is relatively short, but uh, when we trigger I.O., um, our task stops running and yields the CPU to, an to another task uh, until the I.O. operation is completed. Um, but because um, idle tasks never preempt the execution of uh, non-idle tasks, um, even after the I.O. operation is completed, our task A doesn't get scheduled again um, for like something like a second, actually. Um, so, um, so this allows us to, uh, deal, uh, to, uh, to make the, this user um, copy operation that is happening while holding the mutex uh, uh, stall for an extended amount of time. Uh, and uh, we can repeat this uh, if we have a large uh, user copy operation. So we can uh, map a bunch of pages so that the read ahead logic doesn't fire, uh, for example, by explicitly opting out of read ahead. Um, and then uh, we can, by spawning a bunch of processes, make it so that the um, get dense operation on a procfs um, writes over something like 21 pages. Uh, and then we get one, something like one second of um, delay for every, uh, for every single page fault, uh, um, waiting for the scheduler to move us back on the CPU. And then this gives us something like 21 seconds of total delay uh, for, um, 
uh, and uh, for this duration, we can store the get pitcon call. Uh, well, I went through my slides way faster than I expected. Um, yeah, that's it. So questions, I think we would many. I uh, think you actually there is a lot of interesting details and the part for the KSMP and the memory tagging is actually fully new for me, so I'm gonna check that that sound very scary. <laughs> Thanks for the great talk. First question about the first bug. Why it is easier to exploit on kernel before 4.9? Was it a schedule or change in uses? Uh, no, it was, it was a specific change in the like, vulnerable code path. Um, so um, uh, uh, basically, the, the code behaved differently depending on whether the PTEs that was flushing were writable or not, and in the case uh, where the PTEs are writable, it would actually do a TLB flush earlier uh, on your kernels. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And uh, second, about second bug, I like user fault of D as well very much. And um, but there are cases when you have several K3 calls uh, before you have uh, uh, your code running, your spray running. What happens then? So it is uh, the freed element is somewhere behind in the free uh, free list, and uh, your next uh, allocation doesn't reach it. Yes. So I actually kind of oversimplified this here a bit. And what I uh, actually did was I think I. Um, uh, I did a. I opened um, slash dev, uh, sorry, slash etc slash crontab a bunch of times, um, and then I used KCMP on each of the opened instances to see whether one of them um, uh, managed uh, to reuse the same memory uh, allocation. Uh, so, like, uh, yeah. And uh, what was the size of uh, slab element? What, which slab cache uh, did it happen in? Uh, file structs have their own slab cache, um, like modulos, the, the like a slab merging stuff. So they're not they're not on a KMalloc slab. Ah, okay. And uh, how how many uh, files uh, with uh, crontab you had to ha to open to just reach it? Was it a lot? Uh, don't know where I put this. Sorry, uh, I don't remember. This was like 2016. Uh -huh. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great talk. Our questions. Looks like I've, everything was very clear. Or <laughs> no more questions. Might be quite ignorant, but um, on normal desktop Linux, all these scheduler, set scheduler calls, anybody can make them, right? But can can normal user code do that on Android as well? Uh, yes, normal user code on Android can use like set scheduler and the pinning stuff uh, to like make themselves to to move to idle priority or to pin to specific CPUs. More questions? Well, if not, I guess we can, the next thing, first thing, the speaker, 